this really wasn't meant to be a, a message tonight on the book of Acts. But I think it's essential that we kind of be able to understand what we're jumping into. Because we jump into these stories and then we extract reality out of the story. But with no context around the story, all we have is another story we don't understand. And so now we're just quoting verses that we don't have any support for. So we have Simon, who is a follower. He's been baptized. Peter and John have come down from Jerusalem and begin to baptize people that they received the Spirit. Verse 18, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Now, we don't get this here, but in chapter 10, we're going to figure out what he saw. And in chapter 10, we learn that what Peter saw when he went to the house of Cornelius is that people began to speak in tongues. I'm not here to preach tongues to you tonight, but it's a reality of the book of Acts that a manifestation of them having received the Spirit was that they had a prayer language and they could vocalize that prayer language. And by hearing Gentiles do that, Peter realized, hey, they got the same Jesus I got. They got the same Holy Ghost I got. So Simon sees something happen in Acts chapter 8, and it infatuates him. It amazes him. He thinks it's amazing that Peter, by praying for people, these people begin to to speak with other tongues. They begin to manifest the Holy Spirit. And so in verse 18, he sees him lay on the apostles' hands hands and the Holy Spirit is given, and he offers them money saying, give me this power also that anyone in whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Did you catch what he did? Boy, I'd love that power. How much will it cost? So he pulls out his wallet. This is just a tip. We're going to have a business transaction. Name your price. Pulls out his checkbook. Name your price. What will it cost for me to be able to do what you do? I want to be able to lay hands on people and see that come out of them. What, what's it cost? Now, we mock this. We laugh at Simon the sorcerer. But I think you can tell where I'm going to go with this. How many of us have went to the Father and pulled out our, our works checkbook and said, hey, what would it cost for my kids to be blessed? What would it cost for me to walk in the anointing? What would it cost for me to have favor in my marriage? What's the price? In fact, we even like to use that tactic on people in the church. We get up and preach sermons called count the cost, pay the price. I was raised in classical Pentecost, and I very clearly, very vividly remember people standing on platforms and saying, do you want to know why brother so-and-so is so anointed? You want to know why he is so full of the Holy Ghost? Because he paid the price that most of us won't pay. And I remember standing in those churches and putting my hands up and closing my eyes and going, God, if you'll just show me what that price is, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to pay it. And when I went into ministry, I thought the price was probably purging. So I went into the ministry in high school, dropped out of everything. Quit the clubs, quit the stuff, didn't go to prom. Quit going out in public with all my friends doing all the stuff they were doing because I was going to pay that price. Man, if God ever was going to anoint somebody, he was going to anoint me. I'd already figured out that if you could have it, you just need, I just needed God to tell me how many zeros to put on that line. Now, of course, I'm not talking about real money. Simon's talking about real money, but I'm talking about me. What part of me needs cut off in order to God to do what he wants to do? How do you think the apostles are going to respond to this? Requests. Acts chapter 8, verse 20, Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray to God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Now, we do not see... Peter, with the graciousness that we would see Paul treat this man, say, book of Galatians, say, book of Romans, say, book of Colossians, say, book of Philippians. Why not? Well, we aren't there yet. Peter's in a developmental pattern. Peter's just now getting over the fact that he betrayed Jesus, warmed his hand over a charcoal fire. He can't even believe he's been called to do what he's doing. He's still trying to shed off the baggage of the Judaism that he knew his entire life, which is built inside of him a guilt and condemnation complex. I mean, my gosh, when the guy denies that Jesus was alive, he decides to go back to fishing and runs back to his former pr- profession immediately. So this is a guy trying to shake off a lot of that old performance excess. You're not going to see Peter respond to this guy the way Paul does, but Peter makes an incredible statement. Now, Peter was not there for Simon's conversion. Peter did not see Simon get baptized like Philip did. Peter comes in as the closer. Right? You know, 
Philip started the game, but Peter's closing the game. He comes in praying for people to receive the Holy Ghost, and here comes a guy pulling his checkbook out going, how much do I owe you to let me do that? And Peter says, what in the world are you talking about? Your heart's not in the right place. You, you don't know what you're asking.